This is me, the Undead Viking. Every once in a while, a game shows up and has a cover like this, and I know <laughs> from the get-go uh, that I'm going to like this. This looks like something that should be on one of my Entombed albums, if you will, if you're a death metal fan, <laughs> and and I am. But anyway, regardless, um, you know. So uh, when I saw this show up, um, I knew I was going to like it. I cracked it open. I played it with my buddies, and we have had a very, very good time with it. Cryptic Explorers is a game in which uh, it is the one versus many type of game. One person kind of portrays the role of the dungeon master, and I'm using that term loosely because you are not the dungeon master in this game. Um, the other players are the people that are invading your dungeon, if you will, and trying to escape uh, with a goal and then also with their lives. So by dungeon, I mean... Uh, the world of the dead, and by Dungeon Master, I mean, no, you are a goddess of death. Uh, you are, like, this this omnipotent being uh, that basically, uh, at some point in the future, uh, technology has been created uh, that, that opened up the spiritual world to us, and people are able to invade the world of the dead. And when they invade the world of the dead, they're able to then uh, gain knowledge of the dead. And, of course, the, the goddesses of death do not like that. And uh, whenever it is invaded uh, by these 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 characters, these necronauts as they're called, um, they are then uh, set upon uh, by the the monsters of that world and also the powers of that goddess of death, and, and they try to uh, you know claim them uh, and claim their souls. So. Obviously, very thematic. Uh, this is not a Euro. Uh, this this is this is as Ameritrash as it gets. So um, let me talk a little bit more about this one, show you how the game is played, and then we'll come back here and I'll tell you exactly uh, why uh, I like this one. All right, cool. This is Cryptic Explorers, and there's a lot going on with this one. Uh, but before I dive in and kind of teach you as far as how the game works and everything like that, uh, I am going to, one, tell you that this is going to be kind of an overview. I'm not going to go through each and every possible action and uh, character type, because there's tons of them and every single monster and what have you. But um, secondly, uh, this is a prototype that I was sent. It is a very, very high-level prototype, but things might change between now and when the game is published. Okay, as I said, um, the theme of this game is, is that we have somehow uh, come up with the technology that allows people to explore uh, the world of the dead. And these cryptic explorers, these necronauts, as they're called, are uh, being sent into these different realms. And this is one such realm. This is, this is the tomb realm. And uh, their goal when entering this realm is that they need to collect five of these cards and basically you collect these by uh, scouting out different areas completing certain objectives and things like that once the team has five of these cards it can be you know one on each on one one on five different people um, you know all five on one person what have you uh, these are like the knowledge of death cards is what they're called uh, once you have five of those and you teleport out of the area um, then you win the game. Uh, the person playing um, the, the, the mistress of death, the goddess of death, uh, in one of the incarnations that is supplied, uh, their job is they need to kill off all the necronauts that are wandering around in their area of the dead. Um, there are six necronauts in every game, uh, depending upon number of players. You will divvy that up um, where, like, if there's you know, like three players, so one person plays the the, the, the the mistress of death, and then the other two people will play, you know, two squads of three. If you have four people, three squads of two. If you're just playing one person versus another person, you still have two squads of three, technically, so they kind of divvy those up, but ultimately they're all working together, obviously, and you're controlling all six of them. All right, so I've gone ahead and set up this board, and yes, this is how the game looks. It is supposed to be kind of dark and dreary and obviously this is the the really good thematic sense of the game you know, because of the fact that you know everything's in black and white you know so it's like very it's very austere if you will if you want to use a big heavy word if you will but you're going to see there are um some of these things that out there aren't actually part of the board you know there are these markers um those are placed on the board 
as per um, the realm guide that you have that, that, that details um, the different, like the Tomb of the Ivory Sands is where we are right here. And so then it actually gives you all the information inside this rule book as far as where to place all of the different uh, tokens that represent different things and also any special rules uh, that might be used for this particular map. For example, uh, these sarcophaguses here um, are able to be inspected and opened uh, by the Necronauts and uh, if they manage to open all of them, if they manage to go through all of those uh, different spots, um, they are trapped so bad things can happen to you when you open them up. Um, but you get a soul token, and soul tokens are used to power up your necronauts. Basically, it's the it's the dying energy of the people that are residing in this hapless realm, if you will. Uh, so you are going. So th those are like one of the the significant things that are added uh, to this map, uh, as opposed to the other two that are included that I played. As an added bonus, uh, if you are able to. Um, loot all of the sarcophaguses that are on this particular map. Uh, the last one that is looted, the person that loots that gets two of these Knowledge of Death cards. So obviously that is a goal that you're going to want to go after uh, as the player so you can reach that uh, pinnacle or whatever, or that, that quest objective if you will. Now this area over here, um, that is the altar of, uh, I believe it's, I forget what it's called, I think it was just like the altar of sacrifice or something. And um, you can get in there, and I'll explain like why it would be, why it's kind of difficult to get in there. But once you get in there, um, you're able to activate the altar. And when you activate the altar, uh, you know the the mistress of death can summon some creatures to to combat you and go after you and attack you. Um, but you start putting tokens on the on the altar. And once it has four tokens on it, like four turns go by and it's activated each time, it kills off all of the uh, creatures that are on the board. So it's, you know, a fairly powerful thing. Um, also, uh, after the altar is deactivated, after that fourth one is on there, uh, you gain two of these Knowledge of Death cards. So, you know, that's another way that you can get Knowledge of Death cards. You can also pick up different relics and, you know, different um, artifacts or whatever that will also give you those cards as well. So there's lots of ways that you can get those cards that you need to need to claim um, but you know obviously each map gives you some cool uh, special sp specific uh, goals that have them and that kind of adds to the storyline of the game if you will now you might have noticed um, there's these little flaming eyeball things those are the soul tokens if you walk over those you just collect those and uh, the players are able to use those uh, to empower themselves empower their items um, there are doors, there are two types of doors. There are normal doors like this that can just be opened. And then there are the arcane doors that are like that. Um, arcane doors are diff more difficult to open. Um, to open up an arcane door, you uh, uh, you have to have a, be a spellcaster or a scientist to be able to open them. Anybody can close them, but you have to have that special power to be able to do that. Uh, the monsters that inhabit this realm, they don't have to worry about that. They can open and close them. They Obviously, uh, they, they know what they're doing here. Um, these, these are the artifact locations, as I said. And the other thing I should point out before I uh, move forward to like actually talking about what you do on a turn is that you'll see these tokens here, and I'll get you a little closer so you can see one. Um, these are monoliths. And on this side, you can see this little hand with a little eyeball. You can barely see the pupil there. But on the other side, you can see the eye is you know, front and center in the location. Now, uh, these monoliths, uh, what they do is... They, um, when they're activated, um, they're able uh, to be turned over, and they're activated by uh, the Mistress of Death that, that you're using for this particular map. And they are able then to supply more power uh, to uh, the the Mistress or the, the Goddess of Death that you're that you're facing. Um, when you have that more power, um, the power is used to summon monsters and use cards. And basically, the more power you have, the better uh, when you are playing, uh, like, well, in this case, in this particular scenario, when we get to our, um, this is Skazak, 
uh, the she of the restless crypts. And so the more power, the better. So that's the other thing. And those can be destroyed. Um, the other players can uh, attack them. Um, once they are activated, though, they are di more difficult to destroy, but they can still be destroyed. And it's never a bad idea to destroy one if you happen to have the extra time and, and the ability to do so. All right, so each person is going to be able going to take a team, and you separate the teams. So like I have this, like if this was set up for a three-player game, I have you know, these are this person's cryptonauts. They're told by you know that little uh, icon on there. This is that person's cryptonauts, like so. Each one of these uh, particular uh, cryptonaut uh, boards has their starting stats. This is their health. They have four health. This is their stamina. Three stamina. They can move four spaces, and they have an aim ability, basically their fighting ability um, of four if they're going to be attacking monsters. So if you have, a, you, you take a job for somebody. So here's like a survivalist. You can see it's like during an upkeep, it restores a health and it's immune to hazards. And you just go and you also see that it gets plus one to energy and plus one to move. And then you just go ahead and put that on your board like so, so you can reference what they have. You'll also notice that it has these spots for equipment um, that say hand, hand one and hand two, so you could have two pieces of equipment. You can carry all the equipment you want, but you have to take actions to swap it in and out. Uh, and also there's a utility uh, that spot as well. And so let me just show you some of the stuff that you can get. So like, uh, you know, here's uh, like a weapon. Uh, so it says uh, the the dawn ray caster. It's piercing. Uh, monsters damaged by this lose one armor until cleanup, and then and then this little symbol here says that that's the little uh, the power symbol. Uh, so if you have collected a soul, if you want to burn that, you could use it to power up your dawn ray caster. Attacks made with this will now have you know they have a plus one aim and they have a plus one damage. You can see this is a range of five and damage of two. And then if when you activate that, it's active for like the entire turn. So you know it isn't a permanent uh, fix, but you can do you, know, you can use it. And you can see this has two hands. So like this would be the only thing you could wield uh, if you had that. Uh, so here just show you another one. Uh, the Amon Glowcaster, you know range of four, damage of one, this tax monster, all cryptonauts have a plus one I aim against it until cleanup. And this may target cryptonauts and restores health instead of damaging them. So it's a pretty cool little weapon that you can have. And one more time, one more, I just want to be able to show you a melee weapon. So here's the solar lance, it's piercing. Uh, it gains plus three uh, range and plus four damage until cleanup. Discard if it hits a target. So you could throw it if you absolutely had to. And you can dual wield weapons and use them both. Uh, you know, there's nothing that prevents you from doing that. But remember, uh, you are limited uh, by your actions that you can use. Um, oh, I should also you know just show you. Don't always have weapons. Um, you could have um, like here's an ecto shield. Uh, so it's like it, the, the oh. <laughs> I dropped it. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. All right, there. Uh, caught it. Uh, so, like, you can see it protects you a little bit. So, let me see here. Gain uh, armor 2 until cleanup when you power it up. And all attacks against the Scriptonaut have a minus 1 to their aim. So, it's more difficult to hit them. So, you get multiple of different things. And let me just show you a few of the different uh, utilities, if you will. So, here you have um, a glowing suit. Uh, immune to hazards and a uh, minus one to stamina checks. So maybe it's like tougher to move around in that. Or um, here's a utility, a light bringer, uh, plus one to movement, an action, deal one damage to all adjacent monsters, ignore all breakaway checks until cleanup. Uh, breakaway checks are basically, I'll go over that when I get to combat, but if you're close to monsters, you know, move away from them, um, you can take damage if you're trying to do it. But, and then this one last one I want to show you is just pretty straightforward, like a medikit. Action, restore all health to this cryptonaut or an adjacent cryptonaut, and then discard after using. So, you know, just not exactly like the most groundbreaking of, of like uh, ideas there, but, you know, obviously good stuff that you're going to be needing and uh, all adding into the whole tactical strategic feel for this game. The last thing I want to show you uh, is that you do have, actually, because there are spell casters in this weird world, and these, this is the Book of Spells, and you can get these spells, and some of them are like um, the Cloak of Yang, a target Krypton is immune to monster abilities, and deity cards to clean up, so it like, protects you. Um, some of them, you know, Mercury Step, helps you move. Uh, the Light of the Heavens, it's a smiting attack. 
Uh, smiting basically means that um, it, you you don't have to worry about you can actually shoot people behind walls and things like that. Um, target monsters dealt two damage, and this uh, Kryptonaut restores a health. So. And you can see the spells actually have a number of hands as well. So depending upon the spells that you're using, you know, you, you have a hands type of situation that you worry about. So like you could have like Cloak of Yang and Zhu's Hand, you could have those two spells equipped. And a lot of the spellcasters, like some of them just say they can't have weapons. So and so like going in with those spells is important. But once again, just like any other equipment, you can swap those in and out. So if you have several different spells, you can swap those in and out with actions uh, to determine what you want to do. So, on the player's turn, the players go first. What will happen is, is that they will uh, take their actions. And usually, um, they're going to be moving around and they're going to be attacking. Uh, that's that's the big thing that they'll be always doing. Um, moving, uh, trying to, you know, going through doors, getting, getting things, investigating sarcophaguses, uh, activating... Uh, uh, the, 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 the altar, if they can make it there, and what have you, um, destroying monoliths so they, they can, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about the, 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 the goddess of death uh, activating those and increasing her power base. Um, and for the most part, most of the stuff you do, you are going to achieve without having to take uh, any certain amount of actions. Uh, without, I mean, I'm sorry, with any certain amount of rolls. Uh, you're, you, basically roll when you're when you have something that is contested much like if you're going to be shooting or attacking something um, you can if you want burn up your stamina to take an extra uh, uh, an extra action if you will so you normally only get two actions but you get three stamina or maybe you have four if you're a certain uh, class or what have you but then you could take more actions so for example like if this person can move four and diagonal movements are fine they could go one, two, three, four, and then they want to move again for their second action. They can go one, spend an action to open this door, two, you know, or spend part of their movement to open the door. So one, two, three, four, but now maybe they like really want to like get this particular token so they could you know, use up their stamina and like maybe grab that as they pass over it and then get next to the sarcophagus so the next turn maybe they can activate that sarcophagus and move it now stamina you you can get back your stamina through resting which is like an action that you can take basically you just forego everything else and that also will heal you a little bit as well um and but the the, the rough thing about using up stamina is that if you ever uh, stamina is used to break away from monsters, and so if you have a low stamina, it can be very, very difficult to get away from monsters who are in the process of trying to rob you of your life. So you, you, there are tactical decisions you have to make uh, as you're burning through those. If you ever run out of stamina, uh, it, go, it goes to zero, your Necronaut becomes exhausted at that point. And when you become exhausted, uh, you can't take any more actions, uh, you lose one health, and um, then you set your uh, your health, uh, you set your you set your uh, uh, stamina back to one, uh, and then you gain an exhaustion counter. And then during upkeep, after the next phase, you remove all exhaustion counters from all players' uh, kryptonauts. Um, but each kryptonaut that had an exhaustion counter uh, removes, um, like you are going to uh, basically skip that particular round. Now, before I touch on what uh, the the uh, person who's running the Goddess of Death can do, let me just talk quickly about uh, health. And I realize I haven't talked about combat, but just bear with me. I wanted to give this brief overview, and then we step into the meat of the game, which is uh, the combat. All right, so... Um, your health is measured, um, you know, by on, on your character sheet. You know, they, they stand, start with a standard of four. And if you are ever dropped down to zero health, you don't automatically die. You, you become, so like, you know, if this monster attacked this dude here and knocked him down uh, to, to zero health or, or worse, 
you don't automatically die. Uh, what happens is is that your character becomes what's called uh, living in between worlds. Uh, so, and you're kind of like in a limbo, if you will. Uh, it is very possible uh, that you're going to be killed if you don't manage to get healing, uh, but you don't automatically die at that point. Um, if you do take another point of damage, um, you will die, however. Um, you are considered to be slow, which only allows you to take one action. Uh, but you can still rest, which is very important if you if you choose to rest as your only action. Uh, and you, when you rest, that really that's the only thing you can do uh, is only take that one action. But if you choose to rest, um, what will happen is uh, you will restore all your 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 uh, your stamina, and you'll gain two health. Um, but if you lose any more, you are killed, and then you replace the person uh, with a corpse uh, counter, which are kind of cool. Like they, you know, like they have these like ripped up corpses. And any loot that you may have had on your character after you die, uh, people can go to that spot and they can loot that. Um, the interesting thing in this particular map, these spots that have these sands here, um, those are like the shifting sands. They're ever shifting sands, and if you like, you die in those locations, the sands consume the corpse, and you're not actually able to uh, claim those. So that's kind of a neat little effect of this particular map. Um, but they, uh, you need to. But as soon as you gain one uh, or more health, you immediately then are out of the beyond the realms. And why is that important? Well, each one of these uh, gods of death or goddesses of death, I should say, um, has like an ability uh, that allows them to, uh, like, basically consume uh, uh, people that are in between worlds, and so and they get a special bonus that they're able to do that, and so. Uh, being in between worlds and not being able to be healed uh, before, um, like, the next turn, uh, you're really putting your Cryptic Explorer or your Necronaut at, at risk because of the fact that it's very, very possible that the, the, that the, the, uh, the, the player is going to uh, uh, kill them uh, to gain their bonus. But anyway, so that is Necronauts other than combat, which, once again, I said I'm going to touch on here uh, real quickly. But... Playing uh, the bad guy, or the goddess of death, uh, is obviously probably uh, more fun uh, than, than racing around the board and being chased by monsters. Um, each one of these, they have different things, like you have this, this power uh, stat each round. Um, Skizak uh, gains one power. Um, they, get, they have a maximum hand size of four, and you get to draw two cards, uh, particularly each turn. Each turn. So um, you can, uh, Skizak can spend a power, and any, to prevent a monster or a monolith from being destroyed, uh, set its health to one. Uh, after summoning, uh, Catacomb Curse absorbs souls. After summoning, if the monster limit is reached, you may attach a Blessing of Bones card to a Kryptonaut that is between realms. If that Kryptonaut already has one, uh, they are killed. And then Skazak may summon monsters adjacent to any monolith, ignoring the summoning distance rule, and monoliths have plus one health. So, as you can see, like if you're playing Skazak, the monoliths are really uh, very, very important uh, to you because of the fact of that summoning. Normally, uh, you can't summon a monster within five spaces of any player, and so smart players will recognize that and they will make sure that they move, you know, their their cryptic explorers um, close to each other, keep them, keeping them in squads, basically so you limit where monsters can be summoned. Once monsters are summoned, they can definitely move in and attack, but like I said, smart players will, will endeavor to make sure that that doesn't occur. However, because of the fact that they can summon them next to monoliths, it's, it's, it's an extra ability that they have. Um, on a, uh, goddess, a goddess of death's turn, uh, what you will do is you will, um, not the first turn because you already have it, but normally what you do is you'll collect power uh, that is going to be equal uh, to whatever your power level is at. In this case, Kazakh's normally one, but for every one of these monoliths that you've empowered, you're going to gain extra. And so they'll, they'll gain whatever power they get. Um, they're going to draw cards into their hand. Um, I'm going to kind of show you some of these cards here in just a second, but each uh, goddess has their own set of cards that are very specific to their abilities. If they have, if they draw cards and they go higher than their hand size, so like if you had three cards and you drew two because you get to draw two cards as Skazak, you have five, you have to go down to four. You have to discard a card. You can't hold on to it. 
And if you just once you discard that card, but for that card that you discard or any cards you discard at all any time, uh, you get a power token for doing so. So that's kind of a neat thing that the goddesses have that like you're using your cards or your special powers and abilities, but you're going to be using those to uh, discarding them as, as resources to gain power so you can do other things with it. Now you can spend two power to empower a monolith. That I mean that's just that, that's just a flat out thing that you can always do. Um, and you can use your your power uh, to you know draw uh, to to use the cards that you draw, and you also use your power uh, to summon monsters. So first the cards. Let me talk about the cards really quick. So. Cards have, um, like, little, so here's like 13 candles, and it says, uh, for two power, you can draw a deity card for each monster in the realm, uh, can only be played once each round. Now, obviously, that has multiple of strategies. One, you get to draw, um, if you get a bunch of monsters on the board, you play this card, you're going to be able to draw a bunch of cards into your hand, things that you can use, things you can discard uh, for power, so you can do other things, and like even like hold on to them until like the next round when you draw your two cards and you get a discard down to your hand size, gain a bunch of power, and have a huge turn. So obviously that's a second thing. Now that's like the immediate effect thing. The lower part is called the mastery effect. These are permanent effects that go into uh, that, that are going to be in play for the rest of the game. So this has empowered monoliths have armor of two, so they, they take less damage, and provide plus one power for each turn. So, you know, obviously, if you can get that, that that's huge, right? So just let me see, like, here's another one. And, and the thing is, is that there's more than one card in the, in the deck, I think, I believe so. And, like, you can double down on mastery effects, so you could, like, really be doing well if you got something like that. Um, so here's a Blessing of Bones. Um, attach or remove a Blessing of Bones card to any Kryptonite or monster. Uh, and then, obviously, we, we talked about the Blessing of Bones, um, you know, special ability that uh, we had there. You know, so you could use those to kill off uh, people that are in between worlds. But, and then, um, here, upkeep. Each monster restores one uh, health, and each Kryptonite at full uh, health loses one health. So, you know, some cool little ability there with a mastery effect. Uh, stiff and cold. Um, each Kryptonite gains slow, can only do one uh, action uh, until next round's cleanup, or if a Kryptonite performs a second or third move action in a round, she loses one health. So if people want to be moving really, really quick, you know, through lots of move actions, they're going to lose health. So I'm not going to go through every single card, but there's a lot of different cards, a lot of different powers and options and abilities to you that you'll be using to uh, affect the board. Now, obviously, okay, the final thing, the big thing, obviously, is the summoning of monsters. So each uh, each goddess has their own specific monsters. That they are part of their family, if you will. So uh, as 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 Kazak, you get the Kryptons, uh, you get the Spectro Fagi, and the Tomb Guardians, and they are represented just like uh, the, the Necronauts by those standees. So the the Spectro Fagi is a larger monster. They they fit in a two by two area, and then the Hounds and the uh, the Kryptons and the, the Tomb Guardians are smaller. Now each of these has their own like special abilities. So like the Kryptons uh, call the pack. Uh, if the monster damages a Kryptonaut and the monster limit is not reached, uh, summon a Kryptown adjacent to that Kryptonaut, ignoring the summoning distance rule. So you can see why that'd be a problem. Now the, the summoning, basically the, the monster limit is you have only a certain number of these standees and these monsters and these 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 particular uh, uh, cardboard standees or whatever. So once you reach, you just can't summon anymore. They, they don't have access to it. Um, but you can see over here, so well, how do you summon them? So this is the power that it takes to summon. I'll talk about the parentheses here in just a second. And then it, here's how fast they move. Here's their aim. Here's their health. And then like if they have any other special abilities over there. And so the Spectro Fey guy, just quickly, uh, action, each Kryptonite within sight in five spaces, this monster loses half their health, rounded down, and then gains slow until next round. So obviously, very, very powerful ability. Um, and then here's the Tomb Guardians. Uh, while this monster is within three spaces of a monolith or door, it has additional armor one and is immune to spell cards. And so you can see, like, very evocative, very thematic, and a lot of fun. And, and like, basically it adds, once again, knowing your abilities, knowing your powers, play a lot into, uh, you know, knowing your capabilities and, and doing uh, 
the best that you possibly can. And, and the more you play this game, obviously, the more you're going to get accustomed uh, to uh, the different the different uh, goddesses and their and their ways, especially and also for that matter, uh, what each class, each Necronaut class, is good at and and, and not as good at. Um, so I talked about these parentheses. So you are allowed at any one time, if you have the power and you can do it, to have one master level monster out there. And so if you do that, basically you pay the extra power, so in this case it would cost three power to summon this one, and then you give it all of the bonuses that it has, and so then it would have the unyielding trait, and then two armor, and like you know, plus two to the, like the, the damage over here, and like nine health and so forth. You, you can only have one, and so like let's look at this picture of a guy, if you're able to do that, you know, like, obviously, even larger. You know, it casts five power to do it, but, you know, moves a little faster, its aim is better, and so on and so forth. So you're allowed to have one bigger than normal monster if you want to pay the extra power, and that's what those parentheses are. All right, so that is... I, I would like to think a fairly good overview of just how the game is played. Basically, the whole thing is, is that you're trying to get those five cards, and so you can teleport out of here and, and live to tell the tale. How do you do combat? Combat is extremely simple. It is really straightforward, but it's still lots of fun because it's got dice. Uh, so um, basically, uh, when the goddess goes, she, they, they can play all those cards into those things, and then every monster that's on the board, they can take two actions with them. They can move with them, they can attack with them, and so forth. Um, as the players are playing, when they take their actions, they can use attack actions to attack. Very basic. If you attack a monster or a monster attacks, a, a, a Necronaut, they have an aim skill. You need to roll that number or lower to succeed. It, and you obviously the thing, you have to be able to have line of sight. So like, you know, if you're here and you're here and like, I'm sorry, let's put a monster there. Like you're there and you're, you have, this is this is four spaces away. So if you had a, a gun with a range of three, you couldn't hit. So you'd have to move forward one to be able to shoot. Um, you know, and then because this door is open, let's say it's like a range of five. You know, actually, there's like a sniper class. Actually, I like, can double the range for the first attack. But you know, whatever. So like, you have a, like you have a range of five. This door is open, so you have line of sight. You can go ahead. You can shoot, and you just then take a die. And if your aim is four, you know, you're saying, okay, well, let's hope I hit. You roll. You got a three. You deduct the damage. If you do enough damage to kill it, you just take it off the board. Uh, if it's a monster. If you don't, you just add. You know health tokens to the spot to show that it's taken the damage and it's carrying over. Um, the only other thing you really need to worry about or could be concerned about uh, is that when you do uh, the attacks, uh, if you roll a six, no matter whatever bonus you have, no matter like what you've done to like boost up your character or anyway, a six always fails. But on the flip side, a one will always succeed. You know, there's lots of games out there like this that have like the the one versus many thing. You know, where you're you're all kind of going against the overlord. Um, and sometimes the combat really bogs things down, but I really, really enjoyed this one because it is very, very quick to, uh, you know, roll through the combat and roll through the combat options very, very quickly. The only other thing I'm going to talk about combat is if you are next to a monster and you want to escape from that monster, move away from that monster, you have to roll on one die your stamina or lower. And so if you've used up a lot of stamina, that's where you're going to have a problem. So like if you had used up, you only had two stamina, you're going to go ahead and roll. I rolled a four. Once again, six always fails. One always succeeds. You lose a stamina for trying to get away and failing, but then you're still able to get away. All right. So finally, the game just continues on. You have multiple combats. Uh, it, it, pretty much every single time we play, it always feels like, uh, like, the Necronauts are never going to win, and somehow they they if if they do win, it's all it's never easy. It you know it's it's something where they manage to uh, you know literally uh, grab victory from the jaws of defeat, and then as long as so like if the like let's say these three people were killed, and there's only these three Necronauts left, and all the bad guys are closing in, you know, so you just have oh, here they come, you know, whatever, and and you know. You know, they're, they're roaring in or whatever. As long as these three people are connected and diagonal is connected, you have to have at least two or more 
Necronauts connected. You can choose to teleport as an action, and then you just pull them off the board, and as long as you have five of these cards, then you succeed and you're able to do it. Now you might be saying, well, can other people teleport as well? Yes, you can have situations where like two Cryptic Explorers could teleport out with two cards and then you play with the remaining ones trying to get you know those last three cards together uh, to be able to pull off the win. You might be also asking, is it possible uh, to teleport away uh, when you are just uh, one person? And yes, you can. You, there is one item, uh, the translocator, uh, that gives you a plus one to move, a plus one uh, to your stamina rolls, and may teleport without being adjacent to another Kryptonaut. And so we've definitely had games where having that card basically sealed the victory. So so there you go. That is Cryptic Explorers. Like I said, there is a lot that goes on. There's a lot more intricacies. There's two maps I didn't even show you. There's two goddesses of death I didn't show you. There's a bunch more monsters and, a, and like a ton of these particular uh, different classes that you can be. You know, the bomber, the archaeologist, the evoker, the parapsychologist, the climber, and there's like a stack of of cards with other uh, classes that your characters can be that I haven't even that I never even shown you. But I, I invite you to go ahead and check out the game uh, at Board Game Geek. I invite you to check out the game on the Kickstarter page. Um, you know, and you can read all about that and, and also take a look at, at the rules and read them for yourself. So um, I really, I just, I like games like this. I always have. I always will. It is that that gap that you bridge between. Um, you know RPGs and and board games and and I and I enjoy these uh, to a fault in some ways, uh, but this one's a lot of fun. I really love the theme. I really love the art. But let me talk all about that in my final. All right, thank you very much for taking the time to watch that portion of the video and learning how to play Cryptic Explorers. I do apologize that I didn't really go like every single moment of every single turn type of explanation with it. Um, I just, I knew that would take way, way, way too long. So I kind of went to try to do overview and cut it short and it still was pretty long anyway. So, so there you go. Um, so I've already really kind of talked about why I dig this type of game. Um, I've always loved the games that bridge the gap between role-playing games and uh, through board games. I mean, they're never really going to be one and the same. Anybody who ever tells you, oh, it's totally like an RPG, but it's a board game. No, it isn't. You know, it just never will be because board games are structured. Board games have, you know, really, really set rules. And the whole idea with an RPG is that, yes, there are rules and there are um, things that you have to follow, but it's a sandbox that that, 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 a, that a GM creates. And, and it really can be anything. And, and anytime you have a box that has a bunch of stuff in it, you are going to be structured by whatever is in this box. So um, that that is what it is. Now, that doesn't really matter, though, because the game's fun and the game is awesome. As I said, there are lots of games like this out there. And, you know, I, like I said, I like those. I, I pretty much like all of them. But um, the ones that have, like, really, really extensive rule sets and really, really extensive... Uh, you know, like like you know, modifiers and and keywords and you know attributes and you know like you know, three page character dossiers and things like that. I mean, it kind of gets in the way of the fun. Yes, you can use all that stuff to make the game more you know more more meaty. You know, like more representative of, of the the theme. Uh, but sometimes you just need like a quick and dirty rule set. And while this isn't quick and dirty, like I said, the, the, the meat and potatoes of the game is being able to run uh, from from the bad guys, uh, being able to kill the bad guys if you're cornered, and being able to control the objectives. And when everything is basically being decided by a D6 roll, uh, you know, I, I really, really enjoy that. I, I, I just enjoy the fact that like... Um, Yes, it does come down to a little bit of chaos, a little bit of luck, a little bit of, like, you know, uh, fortunate dice rolling in some situations. But for the most part, your turns are being wrapped up quickly. Uh, you're moving on to the next player. Nobody's getting bored waiting for their turn. Uh, you know, and it's it's one of those things where uh, I've always, I always kind of dread sometimes uh, playing as, like, the, the, the GM or, like, the big bad guy in these games. Um, because of the fact that, like, if you're playing with the other players and they're taking a long time to go ahead and plot through their movements or anything like that, you get bored. I mean, you're just like, come on, you know, because they're working together, right? You know, they're they're like, okay, you go there and you do that, and I'll grab this and you tuck take that. And what do you think he's got? Do you think he's got that card? You know, and and you're just standing there like, okay, you know, anytime, 
<laughs> and waiting for your chance to actually like do what you want to do. And then of course, when it's your turn, like especially if you don't really have a lot of monsters within range or anything like that, your turn's done in like you know a minute, and then you're right back to that same page where everybody's like, okay, now you walk over there and you go over there. But because of the fact that this rule set is, as I said, like fairly concise and fairly simple, um, playing as the big bad guy really isn't that bothersome. Uh, because of the fact that the rule, the, those those turns get over quickly, and the game, well, and for for its for its meatiness and for its for its you know, theme and for its uh, purpose, actually wraps up pretty quickly too. Once we all kind of understood like the different rules and the different you know uh, terms and what have you, um, we were able to wrap these games up, these scenarios up in about an hour, hour and a half, which you know is a very very good time number. It's not so short that you're kind of left wanting, and it's not so long that you're getting you're like whatever you know checking your time or whatever. So. Um, Everybody was involved, everybody was looking at the board, everybody was having fun. Um, even when, like, the, the, the Goddess of Death player was, was, like, you know, kind of rifling through their cards and taking their actions, everybody was, like, when we played this, was, like, really tuned in uh, to see, you know, what exactly, what, what horribleness was going to uh, uh, befall uh, everybody. So, um, there you go. I mean, you know if you're going to like a game like this or not. Um, if you are fans of, um, like, you know, deep thinky wood pushing euros and hate ameritrash you're probably not going to like this but if you're like me and you dig a really really heavily thematic game with a really like a theme really that like you know is really out there in a weird way um you know uh if you if you like having something a little bit different that's that, that that's of this genre that's on your shelf i strongly suggest that you uh check out cryptic explorers i really really doubt you will be disappointed um the art is fun the theme is great and it is just it's fun uh playing both sides of the coin being the person exploring and being the person being chased equally enjoyable and uh, i think you're gonna like it so there you go if you have any questions ask away i'll be happy to answer those to the best of my ability um as always thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video and until next time i'm the edited viking and i'm telling you to have yourself one heck of an awesome day all right bye-bye